All right, welcome to the April 2nd, 2024 Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting. Um, a light agenda so far. Um, we've got some status updates on some things going on. And uh, that's about it for this, I think. But uh, we'll see how it goes and certainly open discussion. And if anyone wants to jump in with other topics, um, we do have a fair number of issues that I've highlighted that we might want to go through. So that could take a bit of it, but we'll see how it goes. Um, as you just heard from the Zoom powers that be, we are recording this meeting and it'll be posted after this um, as well. Um, this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger code of conduct. Let's be good to one another. Um, if anyone wants to introduce themselves new to the meeting and wants to um, let us know what they're up to, please grab the mic now, or if you have any announcements to share. Sean. Yep. Um, this Thursday in the uh, Hyperledger Identity SIG, um, we're going to have two great speakers. And as I say that, I'm not actually looking at them. But yes, Jorge Flores and, Jorge, and Jesus Torres from NTDAD oh, will be awesome. joining the ID SIG to talk about how an Aries Digital Trust ecosystem helped distribute 60 million USD in counting to essential workers. Uh, the ID SIG is recorded. If you can't make it, it will be posted to the Hyperledger uh, YouTube. Also on the ID SIG channel uh, in Hyperledger Discord, we are talking, we have a new channel called IIW planning. This is for folks to, what, to talk about what are the topics you want to bring to IW? What do you want to hear at IW? Even if you can't make Internet Identity Workshop April 16, 17, and 18th, uh, you can, you know, leave a note in that channel and join the conversation. Thanks, Stephen. That was it. Okay. Um, and was that an open wallet or a Hyperledger IAW? So, so uh, no, we, we have a channel in the Hyperledger Discord uh, as well. Um, I'm sorry, we don't. We have a thread in the Identity SIG disc in the Identity SIG channel on the Hyperledger Discord. Oh, talk okay. About IW. On the OWF Discord, we have it has its own channel. There's also a channel for EIC planning as well if folks are going to go to European Identity and Cloud Conference in June. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. We're going to be talking about a new DID method when we go to IIW. So there you go. A new DID method to rule all DID methods. Aren't you glad? All right. Yesterday. What's that? That April Fool was yesterday. No, no. <laughs> this is real. Okay. Um, any other topics for the agenda anyone wants to bring up? All right. Oh, Patrick. Uh, maybe this is going to be a bit unconventional, but there was a... I, I've been, you know, kind of telling a lot of people, but it was like a vulnerability uh, disclosed last Friday in the oh. OpenSSH library. So uh, maybe just make people aware and just, you know, a reminder that with open source software, like anyone can contribute and, you know, that all code is not... Uh, yeah, it's important to know the people that contribute and that you know, I can touch more about it, but this was a case that uh, someone on GitHub had contributed a code for a long time and they tried to push a vulnerable, like a remote code execution vulnerability wow. uh, out of the blue. And it could have had like very, but allegedly like some pretty bad repercussions. So just to sort of touch on the open source security. I do believe that the uh, vulnerability introduced here was not in OpenSSH itself. It was actually in the XZ compression yes. library. Yes, it was oh. a dependency of OpenSSH. Yes, you're correct. Remote execution? Um, and it was in what? 
Um, I heard about this this morning. Go X ahead. Z dash utils. Dash utils, and um, yeah, the name of the the person that reported it sounded familiar. Was it Andre? Was it Andreas Frund, or was that, or just someone with a similar name? It sounded Sounds like similar. someone with similar. It was somebody from Microsoft. Okay. Okay. My understanding. Okay. Um, is that all you wanted to mention? Um, did so? Did this get out in the wild? Uh, oh, I guess the the so it was like it was like on a bleeding edge version. They caught it fairly soon, but I believe the goal was to make it into a Red Hat uh, release. It was sort of planned to time time with the F Fedora forty. Uh, in the hope that it would get forked by Red Hat. So it's like a, a, a long time plan sort of mm -hmm. action here. There's, you know, some rumors about who, who it could be that it might be like a state sponsored activity. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it could have had some, you know, pretty bad repercussion, but it was caught on time. Uh, Good. Okay. Excellent. Interesting. All right. Um, status updates. Um, and on creds RS, Jamie uh, completed the work just before going on vacation. We are holding the two PRs he's got in place um, until the 0.12.0 release is done. So um, we will have support for an on creds RS by then, I think these are the last two steps. So the um, one is allowing for uh, an instance of Akapai to have both the Anon creds and the CredX um, libraries loaded at the same time and different tenants using Anon creds and or, uh, or CredX. And then the upgrade script allows a tenant by tenant upgrade of um, their tenant to use the new and on creds library. So that work is complete, um, but we're holding it back for the next one for, for the release um, 012. Um, did peer and AFJ is complete, um, is sorry, is almost complete. We decided to do one more thing, which is um, PR 2682. So let me jump up, open the PRs list. And Daniel, do you want to give a, a brief update on this one? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, so the um, changes discussed in the issue uh, 2857 there. Um, so we're, we're adding some flags to a couple of admin API endpoints to help us be able to select which did method uh, we're using for uh, the connection that's being established or for the invitation being created. Um, so I'm I'm working through implementing these changes. Um, I've gotten did exchange taken care of at this point um, and am working on out of band. Uh, the out of band managers create invitation method is kind of scary to look at. So it's taking a little <laughs> bit longer than the did exchange. Um, but uh, yeah, working through that. So, yeah. Um, hoping okay, good. That wrapped up pretty soon. Okay. And, and just a little background, um, after getting to the, um, Daniel got to the point where he was looking at the backwards compatibility of 012 versus uh, 011 and how it would work together and realized there was issues in doing that. So we removed um, some configuration parameters that were added in 012, that were added as part of the upcoming 012. So after 011, um, these two configuration parameters that we did add are being removed. And then to control whether to use a did peer two or a did peer four, um, we've added uh, a use did and use did method um, parameters to various um, out of band create invitation, did exchange create request and did exchange accept. So that was the, the background on those. And then this sort of in this issue gives a background on how things will work together. Um, so all good. And it sort of combines the knowledge that Daniel was um, picking up as he was working through the AFJ um, 
AFJ work and Ian was doing, uh, working on with the reuse of um, uh, connections uh, that we so want to have in um, in Akapai, really easy to use. And um, up till now, it's been a little bit difficult to use and, and not ideal. So that's what that work has done. So thank you for that, Daniel. Um, once that work, whoops, once that work is done, um, we will um, complete 0120 and, and release it. There's a possibility that um, 2348 will go in as well. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but we've got a hand up. So Patrick? Yeah, I thought of just a, a very small PR I'd like to get in 012. And it's okay. Won't take time. It's just in the, the VC API issuance endpoint. I omitted like the verification method options. Uh, so I, I just want to add that back in there. It's it's really just about adding one line of code that's going to okay. add the, the verification method. Is option. that a today thing? I can do it today. I'll do I'll do I'll do it today. So it's, it's I just didn't take that. So it's not going to take long. Nudge nudge wink, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like to see that done so we can get that wrapped up. Excellent. Okay. So that is the status of 12 and what we've got left. Also a bunch on um, on uh, 1.0 that will quickly follow is the plan. Um, 2348. Uh, Emiliano, are you here? You are. Uh, do you want to do you want to uh, talk briefly about twenty three forty eight? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm working through it. It's supposed to fix one of the long standing headaches we've had, which uh, uh, it's related to having to use the admin API key also for endpoints that are um, non administrative in multi tenant mode. So yeah. I basically switched to using decorators for protecting the routes that require um, authentication. Otherwise, they are open. So this allows us to not have to maintain a list of routes that needs to be open, a list of routes that be decorated with administrative um, token, and one that needs to be decorated with tenant authentication. Uh, I'm still working through the test now. Uh, the changes are in. Um, I'm fixing all the unit tests. I need to clean up the latest, the last ones that are related to the old middleware that was removed and add a couple more to test those um, those two new functions that I created. So hopefully sometime this week we'll be out there ready to be merged. Excellent. Okay. And then we'll see about the timing of that. Um, for those not aware, basically um, the a tenant had to have the um full api key to use um use the tenant interface which meant that the tenant had access to all of the um base wallet endpoints which means it could do things like a tenant could do things like shut down an akapai instance and things like that the way it was worked around was to have a proxy in front of um any akapai instant multi-tenant instance and the wallet um, ID that that global ID was injected by the uh, by the proxy, so the tenant controller didn't have to know it, but it it did get injected as um, the request went through the pipeline. Um, so this eliminates that and makes it so that um, there's more flexibility in how it how that is done, and anyone who doesn't put a proxy in front won't be. Um, risking having um, having tenants doing things that they should not be allowed to do. Okay, and I see I've got all the numbers wrong. So 2860 is this one. And so that's the one. So 2860 will depend on the, oops, no, that's, that's this one, but 2860 here. Um, is the one for handling authorizations. Um, so this one, depending on the time, it will go in 12 or 1.0. Um, the non-creds RS work will go in. Um, 
LTS considerations. Um, I, I think we will adop adopt, but this is more a, a um, code management, meaning we've got a fork when we do 1.0 and a documentation change of what it means to be long-term support. And basically it means we will maintain the dependencies um, within at least maintain the dependencies and any any other um, bugs we find in the 1.0 release. So I think that gets us up to having um, both 0.12 and 1.0 defined, um, which brings us to um, issues that I wanted to talk about. Um, Colton, this one you've created, um, you created this issue in Credo, um, we're now ha saying this is also an issue in, in Akapai and, and getting it exactly right. And Daniel, I see you've replied. Um, so yeah. do we yeah. have it right? I'm so confused as to how this became an issue, but anyway, do we have it right? And is Credo adjusting? Right. Um, I, I haven't kept up with all the discussion that happened on the Credo issue, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that Akapai is behaving at least as expected for, uh, the service types that we're using currently. Mm -hmm. Um, so like the didcom messaging service type, which is what we will be adopting for didcom v2 support eventually, um, that has a different expected structure. Um, uh, but for the did communication service type that we're still currently using, I think we're, we're following the appropriate conventions. So I, I don't think this is necessarily applicable to Akapai right now, um, but I, I've requested that they elaborate a little bit more on how it applies, I guess, and, and maybe I, yeah. I will be proven wrong, but I, I don't think it does uh, at the moment, at least. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and specifically what it is, is um, Credo is for their, when they're parsing the didcom messaging type, service type, they were expecting it to be a string, but it is supposed to be an object instead, whereas the did communication mm -hmm. endpoint type is supposed to be a string, and that's the older one that we are using right now. Okay. Thanks for raising this. Um, hopefully this gets sorted out, as I say, pretty soon. Um, and yeah, just to make it, um, get it resolved. As I say, I've not, n never really dug into exactly what's right, what's wrong and, and what should be there, but how do we get everyone aligned and on the right thing, get, get aligned with the spec. So hopefully that'll happen. Um, we've got a couple of things with webhooks. Daniel, you opened this last week. Um, I think Ian's going to take a look at it. And as mentioned, um, we do have a PR in or an issue in to, to do more testing of webhooks. Um, a, and I assume you haven't had a chance to look through this yet and you're, you're oh, going to be no, working on coming up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take a look at it once I, there's a couple of PRs I need to go through and then I'll take a look at this. Perfect. Um, this idea of, of adding it to the integration test, is that, um, is that sort of adding a framework mechanism and then having to add the details or, or do you have, have you given any thought as to how um, integration tests can be upgraded to include um, webhooks? Really yeah, I've given a little bit of thought, but not a lot. It would be a framework type of thing so that it would mm -hmm. be like generally tracking any webhooks that came back. And then from a integration test point of view, you could check to see if the one you were expecting. The sequence was the one you were expecting. Yeah. Is yeah. So I, I think so it, we would detect changes. I think it would be pretty straightforward. I, mean, I won't do it as part of this. this yes, thing. exactly. I'll think about it and maybe do it as a separate PR next. Okay. If anyone wants to help out on this one, um, Ian could give you guidance on doing this 2675, um, which is the, the one for how do we get um, testing of, of webhooks into the, uh, into the integration suite. 
And you'll notice, yeah, webhook here, webhook here. Um, so we've obviously had a couple of issues with webhooks. Um, 2857, this is the one that Daniel's working on that we've already talked about. Um, this is an interesting one. I don't know if, if folks have, have heard about this, but one of the reasons our integration tests are failing is because evidently the algorithm, the did seed algorithm is not random enough. And so we're getting multiple integration runs using the same did um, where an integration test ran weeks ago. Now it's running. And, and as a result, because it's using the same did um, the same, the tests fail. So I don't know if someone knows where that exactly that seed is coming from, but I think it just is not random enough. <laughs> and, and that's where we're getting a problem. Patrick. Uh, what ledger is it using for the integration? Test? Um, uh, B sovereign, B sovereign test. The test, right? Yeah, yeah. I did a, a check of... and and uh, figured this out that we had a fail, and it said, "Oh, this cred def already exists." And I went and looked back, and it had been created about three weeks ago, three weeks before the current run. So, yeah, is there that's... like a, another ledger available, like dev or something that resets periodically that could help for this? Because I, I don't think that <laughs> resets or. And and we don't want it to. This shouldn't be a problem. It's just, as right. I say, okay. the integration test should be generating a random did. And my guess is it's just not random enough. And so it's repeating every once in a while. Um, Ian, I don't know if you remember where that seed gets created on, on starting an integration test. No, I don't remember. Okay. I mean, the other, the other thing we can do is we can just run Vaughn Network a local Vaughn network as part of the integration test, but we didn't do that just because there was issues. Yeah, it seems so painful. Well, the load of having to run everything whenever we run these tests, exactly. they run out yeah. of the PR. And yeah, they already take quite a, a while to run. So. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then the last one I wanted to talk about, um, again, Daniel, you raised this one. Um, Unqualified dids being created in mediation. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, so, uh, with us moving to qualified dids, um, uh, I was going through and and updating things for the did exchange work, and remembered that there was uh, the scenario that we attempted to address in the past for mediation, um, which resulted in uh, basically creating the did earlier in the exchange process so that we had the opportunity to send the keys associated with that did to the mediator and make sure that we got a response back from the mediator before we proceeded forward with the exchange to, mm -hmm. uh, to eliminate the opportunity for race conditions. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I I think that's probably not the best approach, uh, especially because it, it's putting the burden of making sure that these this asynchronous exchange is completing correctly. It's putting all of that burden on the controller, um, which is, I think, oh, a little I bit see. of a high bar to ask of the controller. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, so you want to put it into Akapai. Right. Uh, and in order to help make sure that we can have a, a discrete sequence of events that take place with it being a fully automated flow. Um, mm -hmm. What I would like to propose to the Aries Working Group is essentially that we require that uh, mediators who are the last hop in a chain of mediation, so the mediator that, the, that your agent is actually communicating with about key list updates, yeah. I would like to require that that mediator support return routing and is required to respond in the return route um, for key list updates. So we can do something that's at least mostly asynchronous there and back for the key list update. Okay. Because um, otherwise, not enforcing that requirement uh, places a pretty significant burden on uh, the, mediate, the mediation client because they have to, you know, they'd have to send a key list update to the mediator and then wait indefinitely for them to respond with a key list update response before they could complete 
um, mm -hmm. that exchange that they're in the middle uh, of completing with another party. So um, I, I think that's unfavorable to give the mediator that ability to just wait around. Um, I, I think we need them to respond more promptly and, and to enforce that expectation through the protocol definition in the RFC or something. Um, so Interesting. We can expect to move on to the next step sooner. And but but if there is a chain, doesn't the mediator also have to wait? Um, <clears throat> for chains of mediators, um, the keys used for each forward for each each layer of the message are the same up until the very last mediator. Ah, uh, so it's I only see. The so, last so the uh, so the last mediator medi mediator always knows. Right. Yeah. the The last mediator is the only one that needs to receive keyless updates from the mediation client. Um, so as long as you've established that chain of mediation and you've said, "Got it," to the mediator, this is the endpoint that you need to forward on to next. Um, yeah. That all steps, all hops prior to the last one will be the same always. Okay. Um, regardless of the connection that's. Uh, sending or receiving the message so yeah interesting okay now you said um you mentioned aries working group do you think this issue needs to go there first uh i think it's an rfc thing an rfc question okay um if we can okay. enforce that uh, at the protocol layer then we can address it from the akapai layer by saying that you know um It'll take some reworking, I think, in, in Akapai in order to strictly expect a response sometimes when we're mm -hmm. sending out a message. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we need to discuss it at the Aries Working Group call before we invest okay. time in something that might not be the community consensus, I guess. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I think that's all we had from issues. So I, I have uh, one question slash yep. maybe a request to raise on 2859 with that done webhook for multi-use invitations yeah um i think oh right this looks yeah, yeah i think sorry. we might want this for 0120 um yes yeah because it's uh yeah it, it's breaking multi-use invitations basically for okay for um controllers that are using them i didn't have a 0120 did I? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is a second we need for, um, I will add this to the list of what's needed before and be tracking this before. So no pressure Ian. all good. And that's an issue. Okay. Um, that wraps up the topics we had for today. I guess I should put this one to the top. Um, any anyone have any other topics they want to go over? Oh, Ian, I gather there's a new um. PR for the W3C and on credit W3C VCDM format, and you're looking at it. Is that correct? That's number one on my list today. Excellent. Okay. And you'll be in touch with that team. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So we're still waiting on that, um, that PR to be wrapped up, um, but there's been progress, a, a bunch of progress made, um, and hopefully it's looking closer. Hopefully it's complete, I should say. Okay. Um, I realized I was editing on another uh, window, but, and so I probably made some notes when I was editing an hour ago on a different computer. So, oh, well, any other topics for anyone to go over? If not, um, we'll wrap up early. Akif. Yeah. I have a maybe question for the community since we have time. So yeah. I've been working on, on logging updates in Akapai. Um, looking at a bit of refactoring. I wanted to maybe get some some of the community insight into what they think about 
how the logging is set up right now. I found it a bit, um, I don't want to use the word messy, but um, I tried to like clean up some of the code and split it out into like smaller functions. But one of the things that I've noticed is that like, there's like uh, logic for uh, multi-tenant logging setup that's sort of embedded in the regular logging setup. And I want to see if there's a, there's thoughts of perhaps cleaning that out. Um, if anybody here that's got some experience or has looked at it has some thoughts on that, um, I'd like to get some insight, please. Uh, the only thing that immediately comes to mind on that subject was uh, when that implementation was taking place for the multi-tenant logging. Um, the first pass on it basically went and changed every location where a logger was being retrieved and used um, from the logging interface within Actify. And uh, we pushed back on that because it, it was, one, there, there should be ways to achieve that without having to um, touch every line that uses the logger. Um, but uh, uh, the other reason being it was just kind of ridiculous to touch every line that uses the logger. Um, just a, a painful change, I guess. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not too deep on logging in it. I, I don't even remember exactly all the discussion that took place at that point in time. Um, so I, I don't doubt that there is definitely opportunity for improvement there. Um, but I, I would say that um, it would be preferable at least to be able to continue to use the logging interface the way Python intended it, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and not having to do anything like really, really strange or out of the ordinary, I guess. Yeah. So I guess the one question I have is what are the thoughts on, for example, splitting out like the multi-tenant configuration out of like the regular logging setup. So um, things like that. So it was all sort of embedded in one configuration sort of function that does both. It handles both. Um, and I wonder about whether maybe multi-tenant should be like an add-on or something that's separate from the regular logging infrastructure. So just trying to make it more modular. I mean, not being super familiar with the details, I like the idea at least. Um, modularity sounds like a good goal, sounds nice. Um, <clears throat> and especially since multi-tenancy isn't something that's necessarily active all the time. Um, being able to ignore uh, multi-tenant concerns for like the base logging configuration seems like it would be okay. valuable, favorable. So yeah. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm going to split out that logic into multi-tenant setup and regular setup. And then multi-tenant setup will only be called if multi-tenant mode is on. Um, right now, again, sort of all of the functionality sort of just mixed in. So I'm going to split that out. So if I can push a PR for that and maybe people can start reviewing that, then that would be great. Sounds good. <clears throat> One could argue that um, single tenant is simply the degenerate case of multi-tenant, but I guess that- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the default <laughs> default scenario. Yeah. Um, but really like, yeah, multi-tenant should just be like a separate function altogether that just sets okay. up logging separately from that. Yeah. Yeah. This has proved to be a surprisingly interesting challenge. Um, the multi-tenant use case, um, the way we've, the way BCGov uses it in its traction instances, we obviously want to have tenants, um, business owners uh, of, of a tenant only be able to see their, um, their logging but also be able to see it without having to request it and, and us to have, uh, you know, it should be self-serve. And so that's, that's the goal here. Um, so got to get it right in Akapai before we can get it right in the layers above. Patrick. Just wondering, like when we think about production deployment, what's the ratio of default deployment versus multi-tenant do we is it largely multi-tenants for the production I, use case from people in the call here or we're definitely like... moving everything we can into multi-tenant and so we have we continue to have 
some single tenant ones and um, move towards, um, um, you know, but moving everything towards a, a, a multi-tenant. Emiliano, you know even better. Yeah, I think like it, it will depend for, for the proportion. It would depend a little bit on the use case and organization using it. But yeah. for us, as Steven mentioned, it's, it's likely going to be moving, if not completely, mostly mostly to multi-tenant deployment. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was what Akif said. Like I, I don't know exactly how the logging code is set up. And I agree with um, Daniel that like having sort of like separate specifics for multi-tenant and single tenant is better, especially if we in the future decide to pull multi-tenancy into a plugin or, or or whatever. At the same time, I would be mindful of having as much code shared between the two implementations, just setting up the the log formatter maybe independently. I don't see the too many differences in how they should behave other than adding Absolutely. some extra information in the log statements yeah. versus having two complete separate branches of the code dealing with the stuff twice. Yeah. But again, I haven't looked into the code, so it might not be realistic or it might be something that is already like that. Yeah. I don't know how much like crazy it is, but could there be a, a way that eventually Akapai is the multi-tenant only solution? Well, Which that's what that? I was saying. That's the, the joke I was making, which is make everything multi-tenant and then if you only have one well that's just a single tenant in a multi-tenant world yeah yeah i mean we could go down that that route or that mode of thought and just think of it that way well it just would reduce a... the need to explain what multi-tenant is and exactly well, yeah <laughs> it's it like it would actually reduce complexity exactly yeah, it supports one or more tenants and that's it yeah yeah yeah, I, I kind of like that approach, actually. Hmm. Maybe to think for the 2.0 release one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, take a look at what, um, you know, what that would involve. And, and if it, it does, as we are um, suspecting here, reduces complexity, mm, not a bad thing. Because maybe that could also reduce the complexity of how multi-tenant operates in itself like if it's only yeah. multi because now it's like two exactly. parallels so it could yeah like yeah. there could be a startup option to you know already provision you with a base tenant so like the the sort of the way you would do it now like that would be instead of being your your agent it would be like your your base tenant yeah. that you start with you know you could provide a seed and all this so yeah. Anyway. Okay. I have, I have a couple of thoughts that uh, to derive from that conversation. So first, mm -hmm. I think going to multi-tenancy always. Um, I think once we officially drop the indie wallet support, I think that actually makes that significantly easier, um, because the the Ascar multi-tenancy um, implementation takes advantage of Ascar profiles. Um, which already has basically everything in a single database. Um, whereas in the indie scenario, we had different um, different schemas for like multi-wallet, single table, and single wallet, uh, single database, something like that. Um, so being able to remove all of the indie specific uh, handling for multi-tenancy and focus on Ascar and the support it provides, I think would... Um, make configuration of multi-tenancy a lot simpler for one thing um, because we can just basically default to using the profiles uh, approach all the time because um, that's the the simplest most um, best supported case um, i kind of got lost in what i was saying there but yeah removing indie makes it simpler <laughs> um, and then kind of just as like a little bit of a tangent on this discussion um, I find it interesting um, that I'm actually detecting a little bit of a difference in how we view multi-tenancy, um, at least between what uh, the BC Gov folks and like what I personally like conceptualize when I think about multi-tenancy. Yeah. Multi yeah. um, not that there's a right way or a wrong way, but it's just yeah. finding it interesting that uh, I thought about this differently and uh, to this point, but 
so it sounds like multi-tenancy for for you guys for what you've been targeting is that there's going to be independent controllers for for each tenant um so yeah the yeah the the tenant has the ability to define their the behavior and and stuff of the tenant um whereas in, in my brain i've always perceived it as uh, there's a single controller for the entire multi-tenanted instance. And then it was the controller software that was enabling, uh, you know, the, the tenants to interact with their wallet. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think that kind of gets back a little bit to the proxy that you mentioned um, and how that was a, effectively required in order to keep yeah. the yeah. security of, of the base yeah. admin operations. Um, so maybe as we move towards this uh the decorator pattern that emiliano has been working on um uh we can maybe my paradigm will shift a little bit here but yeah just thought that was an interesting difference in conceptualization yeah um and it's something we've thought about as well in that i've i've had this term that i've used called um traction apps which is this idea that yeah, you could have uh, a single controller that manages multi-tenants in front of traction as well. Um, so it's not necessarily, but certainly our model has been that we expect them to be independent. But um, for the BC Gov folks in the room, um, org book issuers to me would be a single controller, um, but each one would have their own tenant within um within an instance. So that might be an example of where we get to that model that Daniel's talking about. Patrick. Um, yeah, what I wanted to say was about, uh, so first of all, I'm glad I didn't get like banned from the meeting for suggesting that because it's quite a big change, you know, but I yeah. think, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Well, with like a major release. Uh, another thing like, so it's interesting because I, like in a recent project I've been doing, I've been going even one layer deeper than this is that with one Akapai multi-tenant instance, you could create multiple tenant based on that tenant and a multiple tenant. Because if we think like when you have one multi-tenant, yes, you're going to have your one wallet when dealing with the Anon creds in this stuff. But if you just want to manage your did because one multi-tenant can create multiple did and he could even give individual control to these did. Like that's that's sort of the exploration I've been making to use did web, like use Akapai mm -hmm. as the storage for did web. Uh, yeah. In your different, in your wallet, you can register, you can create individual dids and you might want to give control over these did to either an application, an organization or something like this. Uh, so if we go in a multi-tenant only, like even within one tenant, uh, if you provide a controller for one tenant, whoever makes that controller can give more sort of fine-tuned uh, control for, you know, whoever's going to use that controller. Uh, so that's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of possibilities. And I think it, it's a good thing, right? It really gives people the tools to, architecture a system based on what they need you know I, I don't think we should make it like oh you your controller will only use these things i think it's a good thing to have the option to do many things one thing i would like to see eventually is the ability to delete the that you create in the wallet but that's a, a different topic yeah so one more question on that do you envision that eventually we'll be able to support both in akapai so you have um a tenant managed by a single controller, but then you have a controller that manages multiple tenants as well. So like you can accommodate those scenarios for when you need to have single control over multiple tenants. I, I would Kinda assume like that, I would assume that can be done. Um, Emiliano, I, I, the only thing I could think of is uh, Emiliano, are you changing anything that would prevent that in the, um, I know. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. No, the changes that I'm making should should be transparent, like backwards backwards transparent. If like the yeah. the, the scenario that it would be, the two scenarios would be you try to access the um, kind of like the, the multi tenancy endpoints that are administrative using a, a bearer token, 
it will not let you do it. If you have the API key and send the bear token, the bear token will be ignored and the API key will be used. So that's up to whoever is making the request and vice versa. If you're calling a tenant, the API key at that point is ignored. Like it's not required. It's just checking whether the, the solid bear yeah. token is, is in context. Right, yeah. and the, the second use case just requires that proxy that we're talking about, just have an API that sits in front and that then can manage multiple tenants. So, yeah, something... it, would be, it would be a different business logic that just kind of like either always talks to the same one or has multiple keys, basically multiple talk tokens that it can register and, and use. I don't see I don't see them being mutually exclusive. Yeah, for those familiar with traction, I assume that would be basically mean you you've got a controller that has the authorization to call the innkeeper uh, the innkeeper API and and have actions uh, occur based on that. Obviously, they you can't, you can't just call it. You would need authorization to call it. But um, I think that would be the approach, right? Yeah, and I think that's how Traction was originally designed. Was yeah. you had the innkeeper that or you'd have an API that sat in front that basically managed everything. Yeah. But yeah. And and we've we've done it with the UI of traction, but but there's no reason there couldn't be a a controller that had authorization to call the API itself directly. Okay. So um definitely when to officially drop support for the indie sdk um daniel brought that up in chat um i think that's a very good idea and probably we should um push it uh for soon after 012 um perhaps in conjunction with 1.0 that might be the best way to do it but there are vulnerabilities that are known in indie sdk no one should be using the indie sdk we we should um, drop support for it pretty soon so, yes, I think we should do that. Um, I saw a quick hand; it went away. So, any no, other I, I, topics? I just, had, I just had it was me. Just on my head. So, like dropping support for India and SDK, and dropping support for India are two very different things. Like here, yes. we're talking yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. just the how the, the wallet is managed internally to Akapai. Right, yeah. like yeah. just dropping the Indie SDK itself. Yeah, like the code yeah. and within Akapai that managed the wallet with the Indie SDK. Okay. Yeah, we would switch to Askar for the wallet. We would switch to Indie VDR for Indie interface and so on. Yeah. Does does like what what when we talk about the did Indie method? Like as far as I know, <laughs> right now Akapai has no knowledge of that. Right, that's just a purely resolver based concept. Um, I believe Daniel, could you help out on this? I believe there is some support for uh, did Indie method. Um, hmm. I, I thought I, there was. We have some stubs for it, but it's ah. it's not yeah. really implemented anywhere just yet. yeah we we could go to um supporting it in the resolver interface of akapai we could do that today yeah, yeah because it is mostly a, a resolver specific thing um it, it wouldn't be able to interact with quite the number of ledgers um that yeah exactly technically supports because of how we configure yeah. ledgers currently in akapai but uh we could add that um the the place where we we would want to see a little bit more development effort, I think, and would require a little bit more development effort is um, uh, reworking the Anon creds. Yeah. Uh, or, or rather, implementing the Anon creds implementation for did indie identifiers and, and having yeah. support for that. So, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, right now, I could, you know, I can just create a new did and just provide it the, the did indie that I want to use, you know, as the, like the did value and, you know, sign W3C credential with did ND method that use ED25519 2018 signature and it, it works, but that's just me bluntly putting the did when I create my did, right? Like when you create a did solve, you can provide it a did and then, you know, just register that, that did on the, the ledger and you're going to be able to use it. 
but when you do add on cred, like within the code, like right now, it's not going to use the did ND for the cred def, for example, like that, that would still use the did solve from what I understand, which is what you just explained, right? Like you, it would right. be good if the add on creds cred def could be created and issues using the, the did ND URI. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, yeah. And a lot of the, or rather all of the anon creds work that's been going on lately by uh, Jamie and, and Ian um, is has been making that process of implementing the did, did indie side. It, it'll be a lot simpler. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, somebody just needs to sit down and uh, work out the code we use between the legacy uh, indie interface and and the did indie interface and, and, then, and make it happen, no, I, I think. Like, I think that's also dependent on, I know there was like a Hyperledger in the networks repository in the work that, because the DND is also dependent on like an official registry of in the networks. Yeah. And right? that was the intention was the did indie networks is there. Because now they um, use the ID union. I think the uni resolver uses the ID union. They have oh, like really? a rep, rep, I, I, I'm no. asking, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't know about that. Yeah. Right. Because also like, you know, something to be aware is that did indie is dependent. Well, unless they, they cache the network, but it's, it's dependent on, on GitHub, right? Like it's dependent on the, wherever you host your, your list of indie meta, like, cause there's, yeah, yeah. There's no universal way to resolve did indies. It needs to be based on some configuration. And the best thing is to centralize this list of, did ND so that it can be universally recognized as yeah. this is how you access did ND candy or in DCO yeah. testnet. So it is sort of reliant on a hosting ter centralized third party, which right now is like a GitHub repository. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, the, the repository serves as like as a registry, but I, I think in general, I think it would be discouraged to dynamically discover any networks. I, I think most deployments should establish which networks that they they trust and are willing to to interact with, and then have the genesis transactions for those networks and and the associated namespace. Those should be more or less statically defined for deployment, in my opinion. But yeah, um, but we 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 do rely on the GitHub repository for right like. For yeah, like right. developer discovery of of these different networks and exactly uh, okay yeah yeah that's that's a good point that's a good point would you say Much that's like... true for both issuers and verifiers and holders like where you know because all two partner need to to access right. this network so right the verifiers especially I think they should be the yeah. most concerned about who they're trusting and, and yeah exactly probably not be you know, um, supporting arbitrary indie networks. Um, so yeah. Um, the holder question is an interesting one though. It, it, it is be, an yeah. interesting one. Yeah. Right. It, it, it to, to me, it's much like, uh, you know, context files that it, at, at compilation time or, or, you know, at build time, you try to figure out which ones you want to preload and, and grab them all. Because I've seen wallet that you can accept a credential and it's just going to tell you like this is not in my trusted issuers. List. Exactly, you can still store it, but it's like just be warned that you know yeah. this is not something that my developers told me to trust, or I don't know how that works. But yeah, yeah. interesting. All right, well, that's it. That's a wrap for this meeting. Have a good day. This meeting will not occur in two weeks. That's IIW. So we will see you in four weeks on this meeting. We do have a maintainers meeting if anyone's interested on the off weeks. So that will happen next week and the week following IIW. But we will not have this meeting in its next slot because of IIW. All right, folks. Take care. I'll see you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.